there's another one where um, we were, I were desperately getting onto the subject of chat GPT. This is the first time I'm mentioning it. Yeah. And by the way, yes. any future student, university students listening to this, chat GBP3 is your best friend for writing essays and all that sort of thing. Eh? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think like the future of content creation and particularly for writers, um, like in the next couple of years, like AI will probably take over the majority of online journalism jobs. Welcome to the Sevo Show. We have a guest on as we do with every episode and we're going to switch to my camera how are you? And uh, hopefully this time we've got it working. We got it working last <laughs> time kind of with the cheap meats boys, which is cool, but we're still tinkering it. But uh, thank you for the feedback and I'm glad that you guys are enjoying the little camera switches uh, because Ryan's about to have an aneurysm trying to work it out. Now, on to the main event, Zach Wheeler. I got it right. Yep, That's right. It. It's on the board. <laughs> that camera there goes straight to him. Hello, how are you? How's it going, guys? That's your camera. Yeah. And then we go to the main camera and we're back together. We've got his mug here. We've got a sponsor of the show, Hunt and Brew. He's enjoying that. How'd you like that for the first try? Um, really good. No added sugar, so definitely a good option for your health freaks out there. Not a fan of sugar? Uh, I don't mind it, but usually when you have an iced coffee or something, it's just packed full of sugar and you get a bit sick of it. So Exactly. Yeah, it's a good little option. Exactly. Hunt and Brew, there's your plug. We're going to probably put that <laughs> on a separate TikTok already. Yeah. So we're going well. So about Zach. Zach is uh, the founder and CEO, I guess, we yeah. can call it that, of yeah. Context Media, C O N T. X, because he's cool and hip like that, uh, media, and it is an innovative uh, kind of distributor of information to the masses. Online publication. Online yeah. publication. That's yeah. right. As you can see, I'm not the best with words, but you're better. <laughs> so uh, let's start with before you begin, uh, be be began with that. Yeah. How did you get started? You obviously got born. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, got, got born. Yeah, yeah. I was born in Brisbane. I uh, spent the first couple of years of my life there. I don't really remember much of that, but moved around a lot. My parents were like heavy military people. So my dad spent 27 years in the military. My mum spent 11. So we spent a lot of time moving around before ending up in Perth um, and came to Perth when I was about eight or nine. Um, and I've spent most of my, my life here. Um, and before going to uni, spent a bunch of time, you know, screwing around, trying to work, doing blue collared stuff and really just didn't feel like that was like my thing that I wanted to do. Um, and finally went to uni and really opened my eyes up to the world of business and investing and trading and all that sort of thing. Um, made a bit of cash investing and now I've sort of started up my own business context media, doing online news for like science, innovation, technology, all that sort of thing. And that's really what my goal is for Amazing. the next couple of years. Yeah. Amazing. So, so what, what started that journey of once you, once you got there, like you, you, you're inspired to do it, what was the first step you took? So obviously everybody experienced what staying inside during the peak COVID lockdown was like. Um, and I noticed a lot of my friends and especially me as well, were getting really sick and tired of just the, the same old news cycle, mainstream media bullshit, you know, politics, stats on COVID. And it, it sort of got me thinking like, there aren't really many cool news alternatives in Australia, um, for like tech related news, science, all that sort of thing, just like interesting stuff that people want to learn about. So i sort of, you know, saw a bit of an opportunity and decided I wanted to you know, start creating content and doing stories on things that really interest me and would be able to take people's minds off of, you know, like essentially COVID and all the bullshit that you see in the mainstream media about politics and all that sort of thing. So so the, the hatred for all that bullshit, I, I agree with as well. Yeah, it's yeah. just so fluff and you never know who's pulling the strings and the exactly. puppets and all of that. Yeah. What's been the... Uh, What's been like the, the beginning establishing challenges that you had to overcome? So obviously like learning a lot about how social media works is obviously very key. Had a few, the first year was pretty rough learning how to use Instagram effectively, trying to reach out to people to collaborate with and all that sort of thing. But really learning how to um, step outside of the internet and actually meet people face to face and to establish relationships was like the biggest thing for me, a bit of a hurdle. Um, but now I'm sort of like, you know, doing things like this, sort of talking to people, doing like branding collaboration talks, got a few things in the works like that. And that's really, yeah, been my focus, but also trying to focus on how to make quality content for people that they're not just going to, you know, scroll past all the time. And also dealing with, um, like 
employees essentially, like trying to find riders who are high quality. All these things I've sort of just been like trying to learn about in the last two years and it's been definitely a roller coaster, but yep. slowly getting my foot in the door. And just for further context, how old are you at the moment? I'm 24. 24. Yeah. And you've got your online online distribution mm-hmm. media company and you're in its second or third year now? Uh, second year. Second yeah, coming year. Coming up in our third. Nice, yeah. nice. And I mean, there's a lot of businesses that started out from COVID and there's going to be a lot more coming in next year. We'll For get sure. onto that in a sec. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what, what, what comes with the decision process? Uh, now you're in your second year, you're publishing content. Mm. What is your decision process for, okay, that will work? Yeah, so it's really like I have people just sending me stuff all the time. I've got writers coming up with ideas for content and I really just – need to make sure just for the brand and sort of my image for what the business is, is to keep it very apolitical. So nothing to do with politics, really straight down the line, but easy to understand science, innovation, technology content. So if it's a topic that's like, you know, not too intense and can actually be understood easily, can be spoken about, can be written about easy. That's really sort of like what Like the go biochemistry for. of a female? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a that definitely touchy subject there. Yep. Um but yeah, like <laughs> it's, if it can be explained easily, um, or topics that aren't traditionally explained easily and can, you know, you can figure out a different way to explain it. That's yeah. sort of like the things that we go for. Do you find that if you do push into the, uh, the, the touchy subjects, you actually get a little bit more feedback? Yeah. So, I mean, particularly with like, we've had a few pieces of content on Instagram go like very viral, getting millions of views, some of our reels, um, particularly to to do with like COVID lockdowns in China as well. That's like a bit of a touchy subject. Very controversial. Yeah. And some other stuff to do with COVID that, you know, probably shouldn't talk about. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so more cultural side of things. So like equality based sort of stories and all that. So we haven't really touched on that much. Um, definitely be interesting to see how we could, you know, tie science into that. Yeah. Um, just to sort of expand our content portfolio. Um, but yeah, not really something we've really gone down the rabbit hole with yeah. at the moment. Yeah. I, had, I had a go, I had a good look at your, um, of the context media channel mm. on, on Instagram yeah. and the tech stuff is really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I think some of the stuff that we're covering is exciting stuff, which has yeah. like been the goal, you know, just, I want to be able to read stuff and look at content that makes me go like, want to get up in the morning and do something. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, I, I, one in particular you put in, um, there was a slow-mo of this missile going into a truck. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me how you found that and go, yeah, I'm going to put that up. Yeah, so my dad, obviously, um, being in the military, has contacts with people who like do a bunch of like industry stuff with defense and always get sent all these articles and all these different technology things for defense technology. And he just sent that to me and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like not the actual tech itself, but just the way you're, they were able to film it in a way that you could actually see the sound barrier around yeah. the missile. I love that. Yeah. It was pretty spectacular to see. I was like, I have to post this. Yeah. yeah. So what, what sets you apart, even though you found a gap in the market, mm. what sets you apart from the next uh, person goes, I can do that. Well, I mean, like there's plenty of news alternatives similar to us. Um, but particularly in Australia, I just don't really think there's anybody who's doing it at the moment. But what would set us apart is the fact that we've, you know, got a pretty well-established audience now and it takes a little bit of effort to get there. Um, but if I, I guess like I'm a fan of competition, you know, um, if somebody wants to start what I'm doing, I'd absolutely love that and could figure out a way to collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't have a face to the brand. No, not it's yet. just articles yeah. and you're thinking about that. Yeah. Like I think like you could go down like the, just like the content page thing and sort of keep your face away from it. But I think having a, a trustworthy face and somebody who can articulate stuff properly um, is an important part of establishing any brand and, you know, developing strong brand identity. hundred percent. Yeah. And what do you think will happen to the brands and companies who do not take that advice on in the next 24 months? Um, I think that there's obviously the media landscape and the social media landscape is changing and evolving quite rapidly. And But I do think like particularly on TikTok, like you have people doing those like green screen ex- explanation videos, having their face in it. I like those. Yeah, they're good um, because it sort of gives you something to relate to a little bit instead of just like looking at a video and all that sort of thing. So we're sort of exploring that. We haven't really gone down the TikTok road yet, yeah. but that will definitely be our, our next move, I reckon. Yeah. I first heard Andrew Schultz talk about this uh, probably a year and a half ago, mm. he said that the For You page on TikTok in China 
is showcasing purely educational content for the yeah, youth. Yeah, and like hardworking sort of yeah. high work ethic sort of things. Yeah, yeah to yeah. nurture the kids to become more successful mm-hmm. and to, to kind of guide them into an engineering, doctorate, mm-hmm. lawyer sort of value to society role from the content. But at the same time, the Western world's getting fed entertainment, pure entertainment that is completely mm, not useless. Like you can escape the world for a little while, but this world, it creates severe procrastination, almost like a pandemic. Yeah, that's a, a great way to put it, I feel. But, like, I mean, it depends how conspiratorial you want to get about it. But, like... Uh, uh, like, all the way. Yeah. Go for so it. So, like, my honest opinion is that TikTok is used in a way, particularly, particular, you can see, like, the duality between China and how the Chinese algorithm works and the Western algorithm. We have kids getting fed all of this like mental health content, all of this like really bizarre like TikTok dances, like the sexualizing, almost low key sexualizing of children in a way. Um, and I really do think it's kind of destroying a generation of people. Um, and, you know, think what you want of it, but I'm sure that there are bigger players playing the bigger game, sort of pulling the strings for whatever reason. Yeah. Don't have any um, hard evidence to. To say so, but I do think that there's yeah, a bit of a nefarious game going conspiracies, on. Conspiracies, you yeah. know, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, my my understanding of it over the last three and a half years I've been on it, um, the best content that performs for me is rubbish content. Mm. And for me, yeah. the rubbish content is stuff that I've put out on a whim. Mm-hmm. Um, my actual, my, in my top 10 videos that I've posted that have the most views, there's four of them where I was – and this is weird to say, bored one night. I was out of ideas. I couldn't be bothered recording something. And I just went on Reddit Mm -hmm. and found a new clip. I filtered it by new. I filtered it by original. And then I found this clip of a goat headbutting a cat (laughs) off a fence. And I thought it was hilarious. I was like, I'll put that up, whatever. Mm. One of my most viewed videos of all time. Mm. There's another video where they're cooking crabs and then there's the put one in the pot and he's about to like kind of grab it and he pinches it and he like yeets it across and hits the cupboard behind him. Seven second video, one of my most viewed of all time. Mm. I have another account on TikTok and I'm putting out like educational content, like, like meaningful, motivational stuff. The one video I put up that has uh, like a little POV, you know, you have that text, like meme. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then there's like a video that kind of matches the context of the text. This guy running across uh, a little little river and just running across on the steps that if you stop or slow down, you'll you'll lose balance and fall in and says, POV, what happens when you don't overthink? And he just sends it across. Yeah. 20 million views. You got 20 million views on a TikTok. Yeah. Wow. And it got me 15,000 followers yeah. overnight. Yeah. And I'm like, right, if I go down that rabbit hole and, and pigeonhole myself in that niche where just posting memes, it, it, it defeats the purpose of what I'm trying to do. Mm. But if I can make it edutainment, educational entertainment, yeah, yeah. then – and that's what I'm trying to do now more of. It mm. has to be something of value, but it has to be somewhat entertaining. Very challenging to do but it, it hurts me when I have kids coming up to me in the street going love your work love your stuff you know I follow you I'm like what's your favorite con-? like why do you follow me They're like because you're famous mm. and then I say to them well, what do you want to um what's your favorite content and they they give me something and it's cool in a way you know mm-hmm. but at the same time I want to change that for them to go I really learned something from that one video. Yeah, it changed sort my of life. Follow you and respect you for the things that you actually put in a bit of effort yeah. into. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that's really something that TikTok has, you know, exploited a little bit um, is people's um, tendency to just go for something that doesn't require any brain power no. to, to watch. Um, and which is fair enough, you know, people work hard, they just want to get a bit lazy sometimes. But like if you're flicking through, like I, like I don't have TikTok as a bit of like a, like a discipline yeah kind of because yeah. I did have it for a, do- for a bit but you just spend like an hour flicking mm. through videos and you just go and look around and you're like what the fuck just happened like yeah. for like an hour you've- there's a way to train that though yeah true there's a way to train that and I'm, I'm working on it right mm. now where you ask yourself when you're scrolling the moment that your next video hits you have to go is what is this video about mm. And is it giving me value that builds me as a person? 
if the immediate first two, three seconds is no, scroll. Mm. It can't be, oh, my God, it's interesting to the point where you just want to see what happens because that's how they're catered at the mm. moment. Mm. If you can see, I'm about to lock 100 people. No offense to Mr. Beast. He's a goat, right? I'm about to lock in 100 people and the first person to go out of the circle, last person to come out of the circle wins 100 grand. That's entertaining as fuck. And I've watched many of his videos. But does it give me value? Absolutely none apart from I've watched 15 minutes and I get a dopamine hit mm. and then I, I vicariously live through the success of whoever won. And that's what it's about, right? It's like yeah. it's obviously lots of science behind how algorithms work. Actually, I was, I was doing a bit of reading. About, you know how when you refresh on Facebook, uh, you pull it down and it sort of refreshes? Apparently yeah. they had pe- – I don't know if this is a confirmed fact, but apparently they had some people come in to really um, – create the platform similar to how like a slot machine, slot machine. works. Yeah. So you have people going like this, like this, like this all day, every day, sort of reinforcing that dopamine hit and just sim- similar to cocaine, methamphetamine, every single drug you could think of, you're always going to want to be going back for more. Yeah. So I feel like it, it, if kids can figure out a way and I think what you were talking about just then is really important. If you're going to be on platforms like that, you need to actually be conscious of, of what you're doing yeah. and realize that you might get into a bit of a trap where you're just scrolling, like doom scrolling. But if you can, yeah, put in little measures in place where you can, you know, constantly remind yourself, is what I'm watching useful? Is what I'm watching going to educate me? Yeah. You know, if you can build that into kids from a young age, I might actually be able to navigate the social media landscape a little bit. Yeah. More and that's, way. that's part of mm. my forefront now. I'm changing my direction and going, hi, what are you scrolling for? Oh, you're mm. on TikTok. Great. What, what have you learned? Oh, nothing. I'm like, well, what are you doing? But at that age, they just want funny stuff. Yeah. They yeah. want like crazy stuff, shock value stuff. And that doesn't grow out of them if there's nothing done about it. You can change the mindset later, but man, it's hard and it's disappointing too. One one thing I noticed, and I'm not I'm not about to shit on sport, but <laughs> <laughs> but sport is another example of escaping reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I mean, playing it's one thing. Playing is one yeah, thing. Yeah, but watching it and I've like got a number of friends who love their footy, you know, that's amazing. Yeah. But it's it's a very – it's a tricky trap to fall into where you just work, get on the piss on the weekend, watch the footy and that's essentially like – That's it. What your life is. That's you know? it. And yeah. you're like – you go into like fantasy footy or footy tipping mm-hmm. and things like that, sports betting, yeah. Yeah. which is a pet hate of mine. I yeah, to, I'm, I'm not a fan either, yeah. to be brutally honest. Yeah. yeah. And then – Come Monday, you're talking about the weekend mm. and then you're going about going, right, I've got to change my players and, and you know, like some people make a living off of it mm. but others just do it for fun. Yeah. But you add up the numbers. I did an exercise last week with my mindset coach, shout out to Tony. He got me to register all my hours that I spend in a day, eight of them already done for sleep. So I've got 16 to play with. Then work, like genuine work hours, I allocated probably four or five hours of work a day. Oh, not bad, right? Yeah. But then the other eight, nine, 10, 11 hours, I'm breaking them down going, holy shit, I really don't have much time in the day for to fuck around with at all. And then he said to me, however you distribute your hours or however you want to distribute your hours in the day, make sure you have at least one hour in lieu just in case – for something, if shit happens, mm. you got to go battle stations and, and like, like then and there an emergency, you have to have that hour ready. And I'm like, holy shit. So that means I realistically only have 15 hours in the day to get things done to achieve my goals. Yeah. And it's like it, it, the earlier you wake up, you sort of, you realize like get, getting up early is a great habit, but yeah, yeah. like the day – it go like goes that, so quick. Yeah. It's like what two yeah. eighteen, yeah. and I've done three things. Mm-hmm. They've been meaningful things, yeah. but like, it, like in four hours, I'm having dinner with a friend, mm-hmm. which is something we allocate as well. It's important to to do that, but it's it's really starting to change my mindset. Like mm. this one single activity, Tony's going to be frothing hearing this, but I'm like on my phone, and I'm like, have I allocated this time? Is this the right? No, it's not. I'm actually wasting my time. It's eating into my work time or it's eating into like it, I've, I've gamified it. Mm. Once you gamify something, it's a lot easier to, to handle it. So now I've procrastinated less. Everything I'm doing on my phone is like, is it going to be, is it fulfilling a purpose mm. of something in the future? Yeah, I kind of feel like <clears throat> if you break it down day and just like a bit of a schedule, 
it's important to, and you're obviously a very busy person. Like I like to keep myself pretty busy. It's important to, once your day's done and you've achieved all you wanted to achieve, to look back on the day and actually critically think about, you know, what have I done today? Have I done exactly what I wanted to do? Yep. How can it be done better tomorrow? And have I actually, you know, achieve what I wanted to achieve? Like a lot of people just go through the day and then just go home, flick on Netflix, chuck on Netflix, and they don't actually critically reflect on how that day yeah. has been. And, you, and you, it, they sort of just fall into yeah. the habit of doing that. And the worst thing about that is those are the same people, the majority of the people that complain about their job. Mm hmm. Mm. And I'm saying to them, what do you do in your spare time? Oh, I've got kids. I've got family. I've, I've got to, you know, cater for them. I'm like, I guarantee you, you still have downtime that you fuck around with, that you don't develop yourself to get out of your, your, your mess that you've dug yourself in. You know, uh, FIFO workers are a prime example. They come in at an early age and they get their $100,000 salary yeah. really early, yeah. like early 20s. And then they get a mortgage, they get jet skis, they get fucking three Hiluxes or whatever. And yeah, they're stoked. Five years later, they've got so much debt, but they can't get out of their job. But then they complain. And I'm like, hang on, you're working how many weeks a year? Two weeks on, one week off. What are yeah. you doing in that one week? Two thirds of the entire year. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing that one week? Oh, I'm seeing my family. I'm like... Okay. I'm getting on it. <laughs> You're, yeah, and getting on it. I'm like, okay, yeah. you're seeing your family a third of the year, which is what you hate because it's not enough, but you need to because you feel trapped in the industry, hence why you're working the other two-thirds of the year away completely and you're only contactable via social media or whatever. Why don't you do something about it, you know? Use that one week that you have – Yes, you still see your family, but, mate, you're not going to be with them for the entire 16 hours awake. Mm. You're going to have your own personal time, and that personal time needs to be the hustle. And, I mean, like, yeah, like that's great advice, but it's just I think <clears throat> expecting everybody to, you know, be motivated enough and have the same level of ambition as, say, like somebody who was very ambitious. It's like something I've actually struggled with, you know, trying to find people who sort of, match your level of drive to achieve what you want to achieve. Yeah. And like having your homies, having your brethren um, is really important. Like I'm one of my top things in life is loyalty and remain like family is like really important to me. Yeah. And all of my friends, I feel like are my family, but there are times that you're going to have to step outside and really judge whether or not you're spending the right amount of time with the right people yeah. and put the measures in place to make sure you can achieve what you want to achieve, but also, you know, balance your friendship life, yeah. balance your, your family life and all that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's all about yeah. balance. For me, I want to help everybody in that situation. I want to help the ones that complain the most, mm. but also the ones that are silent about it, the ones, you know, the, the, the depressed ones, the real, the real strugglers who don't even talk about it before it's even too late. And that's the reality we live in. But if you're complaining and you're doing not doing something about it, that's that's a big issue. Yeah, like com, com, yeah, like obviously everybody knows a complainer, you know, somebody who's just critical of everything. Yeah. And I, I'm guilty of that. Like I'd, you know, after a long day or something, um, you know, just talking shit to yourself or like to somebody close to you, you're like, you fuck this, fuck that. You know, <laughs> but yeah, you wake up to wake up the next morning and sort of just realize that, you know, life's good. And, yeah. you know, what really matters is what you do today yeah. to really achieve what you want to achieve. Yeah. But, yeah, I think it's just um, there are people who are going to be motivated and there are people who are just not going to be motivated. Yeah. And, you know, you learn after a while just to um, try not to fix all the woes and you just get on with it. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, gave a, I gave this advice to someone six years ago and they recently took it on. I said to them, are you going to make something happen? Or are you going to make excuses? Best feeling in the world when she messaged me and she said, that stuck with me for six years and now I've actually done something about it. Yeah, that's amazing. Because she said to me, I was making excuses for six years. And I was like, Eureka. And it won't happen straight away. And that's why I have patience with people. Someone wants my advice, here you go. And I give them accountability as well just to see how serious they are, especially if they want to work with me. I'm like, okay. You want to do this? Okay. This is the next three things you need to do. I'll give you a week to do them. Show me what you're made of. 
And if in a week I don't hear from you, I'm not going to follow you up. Mm. It's not my problem. Most of the time they don't hear, I don't hear from them again because I've helped them realize it's not for them because they're, they're not into it. But the ones that have stuck, the ones that have done it within a couple of days, you know, and have over-delivered, and it's just simple things and it's more so a personal benefit for them, not for me, like, you know. But then, but then it comes time to rely on those people. And that's my kind of next segue for yourself. You have riders, you have people working with you. Do you have employees, actual employees? I wouldn't call them employees. They're they're people and some of them are uni students just studying journalism who came to just get some writing experience. That's awesome. So I get them on board. I've got a couple of people that I pay to write and like bring me content and stuff. But most of the editing um, and the video editing, article editing and all that sort of thing, I I just do that sort of stuff. That's awesome. So with the people that you do hire – whether it's ad hoc or on a contract or whatever, even in part-time, you rely on them? Um, Yeah, I would say that I do, yeah. And has that come – was that a challenging thing to learn? Yeah, so I mean like I think one of the biggest challenges about running any business is how to manage people, People. I guess, Mm. and setting expectations um, but not being like a cunt about it either. That's – that can be tricky. Um, <laughs> and then and having, because you have expectations, you know, and it can be, yeah, a challenging minefield to, to um, wade through. Um, yeah. But I think anybody can do it, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I've got four writers with me at the moment, and I've got another dude who sort of sends me video content, um, sort of thing. And a couple of them are paid, a couple of them, as I said, are uni students. So yeah, the next goal will be to actually dump some more money into it because we're at the stage now where it's really got a bit of a platform to build off. And this has sort of been my goal for the last couple of years, trying to get the social media there, have some people who are like dedicated to what I want to do. Yeah. Um, but you know, how about, how do we go about expanding more? And one of the bigger challenges is actually figuring out the best way to monetize the content because particularly for the news industry, like you've obviously got like native advertising and all that sort of thing, moving away from like the traditional advertising model. But yeah, there are so many different ways to, to monetize. Um, and I think Instagram's introducing... Um, subscription? Yeah, subscription stuff yep. if they invite you to do it, but I'm sure they'll open it up to more creators yep. soon. Um, and doing advertising stuff on reels and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, just trying to figure out where we sit in the monetization pool is sort of my focus, but also making sure that the people yep. who are writing and doing stuff for me are um, feeling comfortable with what they're doing. Yeah, you got to plant the seed. you got to do a lot of collaborations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and collaborating is mm. a big thing I've learned because I spent like obviously the first year I was like, oh, this is my first business, trying to learn as much as I possibly can, you know, staying at home all the time, sort of doing everything myself. But you learn that like you need to put yourself out there, yeah, you know, 100%. Um, make relationships and like it'd be – it'd be challenging, but like for you having like a very niche sort of business, being very Perth located and doing other stuff that you have in Melbourne and all that sort of thing, attracting clients and all that sort of stuff um, would take a bit of practice. But if you're trying to aim for like a global size audience and start very small, it's like can be, yeah, it's a definitely be challenge. You just, just got to do gotta it. You got to go for it, accept yeah. the failures as learning moments and then, yeah, go from there. Um, you're mentioning your, your, your helpers. And you're mentioning, you know, having them kind of be happy with the work and be happy with the scope and the deadlines mm-hmm. and all that stuff. What I found is you put the ball in their court and make and, and get, give them the uh, responsibility of setting their own pace. Mm-hmm. Then you say, right, this is the pace that you want. This is what you can do for me in X amount of days, weeks, months. Cool. Well, how much do you want for it? Negotiate that. Cool. Done. Are you happy with it? Yep. I'm happy with it. Away you go. Mm. It's kind of like when I was a school teacher, I learned that I can't tell the kids what to do. I should not. Yeah. Like I feel like being a teacher, you would probably, your first instinct would be to micromanage. Yeah. Well, at first it was, Mm. but then I let them set the terms and that was a game changer. Yeah. And and some mentors and some lecturers at, at uni kind of hinted on that, but they didn't really explain it more because they've been out of the game for a while. They're just lecturers. Yeah, yeah. And I really took it to practice and I said, here is three different options you can do today. You can do it practically, you can do it visually, or you can do it written. Go for it. And they're like, what? What do you mean? I can choose the way I want to do it? I was like, yeah, 
of course you can. Mm. Which one do you prefer? They're like, I want to do it practically. I like doing it hands on. I was like, here are the tools. Go for it. Mm. Ask any questions when you get stuck. And then they're like, oh, cool. Write down what you find because I've got a science background as well. It's, uh, it's tinkering the variables to succeed in what you want. And you only change one variable at a time. The constant variable is the children. The, the variable that changes is the different age groups and what you're, what you're teaching them and how you teach it. But once you knuckle down in their psychology, which isn't too hard, like child psychology is fascinating. One of my, mm. one of my biggest fascinations is because if you get that, if you understand the next generation, you understand how to get to them later on. Sounds evil, mm. <laughs> but in terms of marketing. But you also see just how vulnerable they are. Really, yeah, the exactly. The yeah. And that's where I'm, where I'm, what I'm learning right now to then be able to educate the kids when they step into the workforce or even before then to educate them and go think a little bit more critically, which is kind of hard to do for them. Like you see these videos of these kids, like they do these experiments where this dude calls up the dad saying, hey, can I do this experiment where I, you know, pretend to be a 15-year-old boy or something, talk to your daughter on Facebook, see if she opens up the door. Mm. It's amazing how they, they open it up because there's no online education. It's all physical. It's all in person. Yeah. Like stranger danger. That's all we learn from. Even, but like, even, sorry to butt in, but like even yeah. with kids, like they obviously cyber, you could like cyber education is important, but like it, there's like this gap where like people from my generation are pretty savvy about that sort yeah. of stuff. But then you have like people in their late thirties going into their forties, even working for organizations and they have zero understanding of anything to do with cybersecurity sort of stuff, which is sort of what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, um, and I think obviously there's a massive gap there for kids um, and even, but even for older people, not really knowing how to navigate social media or like predatory behavior, yeah. all that sort of stuff um, online. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's where education is uh, one of the, online education is one of the most um popular niches going into next year. Mm. Um, did I say niche? It's fairly, fairly broad. You can teach anything online these days, but there's, there's not enough out there. Like you can find things, but the only problem is people find those gaps to chase the money and they deliver a shit product. Like over the last three years of TikTok, I've seen so many TikTok gurus and TikTok coaches yeah, and I'm like, guru for everything. <laughs> you are, you have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. And none of them have actually practiced what they've preached. Mm. Yeah, like it's an interesting saying, like the easiest way to make money online is to teach people how to make money online. Yeah, and, like be, and be one step ahead of them. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just like, no thanks. Yeah. And and like I'm seeing it all over the place. I'm like, and COVID's brought out so much, so much more, like especially when TikTok came in and disrupted Instagram, all these Instagram gurus just became invisible. Mm. Some of them pivoted to TikTok and it's so hilarious watching them. And I'm like, you, this isn't your platform. What are you doing? And people are buying it. And the worst part is when agencies do it, when they go, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort your TikTok out. Mm. I had clients. They have no idea what they're doing. No. <laughs> I have clients that were paying um, four or five grand a month for four pieces of content a week. That's pretty crazy. And I look at the content and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. You're yeah. paying, you're paying $5,000 for this shit. Yeah. Wow. And you know, I boast a builder. I've grown a builder to the most followed builder in Australia on TikTok. Yeah. From wow. zero. And I help Red Rooster come on the, like put them on the map on TikTok. You know, I've done that shit mm. and I've booked out my business two years as a wedding photographer. Like I've done it. Whereas all these agencies and I'm not going to mention any of them, but they're all going, yep, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that. One-stop shop. And then I'm getting clients or when I'm talking to clients who are like, sick of it, they go, spend a hundred grand for this last three months of this campaign and this agency can't prove that it's working. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And that's like a serious amount of money. Yeah. Huge yeah. gap in the market. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, right, let's do it right. Let's take our time. Mm -hmm. Let's not focus on hiring like cheap people that are skillful, that have the skills or the knowledge, they don't have the experience. And I kind of get when companies go, we're, we're seeking for five years experience. I kind of get that. Well, yeah, because this is just to filter out all the yeah, people who yeah. literally have no idea what the fuck they're doing, you know. But there's, there comes a compromise. If you're really passionate, prove it. Mm. Like show me that you want to learn because all the skills and the experience can be taught and gained, but your mindset, your attitude 
is something that you learn yourself, mm. you know? Yes, people can help you. Like I've got a mindset coach, but uh, – how do you find that, by the way? I've got a number of friends who use, I've never used one, but I've heard they're pretty, oh, mate. pretty bit of a game changer. Um, so I mentioned Tony before, mm. um, definitely hit him up. I'll, I'll give you the deets after. The ones that, the ones that don't do, they teach, right? Mm. But there's also a select few that have done it. They've done it well to the point of almost mastering it. They, they teach as well because there's nothing left for them to do, right? You can just keep doing the same thing. But like for me, for example, I like more fulfillment from teaching other people. Mm. I've got a teaching degree. It comes, you know, complementary to what I do. Creative uh, creative who teaches creative, I'm just like, I'm on here, right? But with Tony, he's, he's an educator too. So he's got that understanding of how to educate people. For me, it's systems, right? My weakness is systems, actually writing systems down. Mm. I figured out a way to do it. That's easier. And now we're on. I'm like, cool, here's a system. I've wrote, written it out and I'm going to teach it to you. And that's what I do. Same with Tony. He's written out a system, multiple different kind of resources every week that we go through and he's cracked it. Just you know, fine tuning it a little bit, using case studies, success mm. stories. Like over the last 12 months for me, my clients, I've succeeded, but I've also failed in, in areas with each one. But those areas I've gotten better for the next one. And that's what happens in the first year. All these, Yeah, it just all becomes like a bit of a learning process. Yeah. That's what I was talking about before. Like you need, yeah. to, you need to be critical of, of yourself. That's you it. need to review what you're actually doing and not just sort of flap around in the wind. That's it. And actually figure out ways to to get better. Otherwise yeah. you will remain stagnant. You know? And you gotta you got to document all your successes and how mm. you got your successes. Matthew McConaughey talks about this as well. He journals. He journals. I think I've, I've seen that actually. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. he journals the negatives and he mm. journals the positives because if you don't journal the positives and then you find yourself in the negatives, you need to reflect back on the positive days and then you can look at them. It's a variable, right? Mm. Science. It's literally science. And then you go, hmm, in my good days I was doing A, B, and C. Right now I'm not doing A and B, but I'm doing C very well. Let's put in A and B and see what happens. Works every time. Yeah, and he's also, I've seen that, but there's also another one where he's, he's talking about his journaling um, strategy and he goes like write down lots of little easy to to achieve goals Quick for wins. your day. Quick wins. Yep. And that you can look back on even if you had a shitty day, you're like, oh, look, got out of bed. Not many people can do that in the morning, you know? Like it goes off this, rattles off this list and it's just the, and also the way that he speaks is also very inspiring. So oh, that's mate. probably helped. But Have yeah. you read his book, Green no, Lights? I haven't. I've heard it's very good oh, though. Anybody that wants to really get inspired by something, read Green Lights by mm. Matthew McConaughey or, or listen to it like I did because you can hear him. He actually does it himself yeah just just hearing his voice in a narration rad, rad, rad. oh my god it's so good it's so good so going back to your company and what you're doing um what are your success stories um well my biggest success story actually came before context and that was really learning how to invest money um because I spent, like I didn't finish year 12, I spent a bunch of time flapping around doing labouring jobs as I was talking about before, um, blue collar stuff and I fucking hated it and I knew I needed to do something about it. So I started educating myself on financial markets, um, investing, stocks, all that sort of thing um, and in 2017, sort of had a bit of a stock portfolio but had a massive gain um, investing in cryptocurrencies oh, like a lot of people. I was hoping you wouldn't say that but yeah. <laughs> go on, keep going. Why well, did you make a loss? Oh, it, really? No, did you? Oh, no, no, no. no. I'm just uh, – I'm just Not uh, about it? I'm so over it. I'm a big crypto guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like – yeah, the last the last twelve months have just been really like what the uh, yeah, fuck. Yeah. Like if you if you've been in for only for about a year, it's been I've been in for a while. Yeah, it's just I've been, been, been very careful. Yeah, yeah, and I've just yeah the FTX thing, um, which is absolutely just pulled the bottom out of the entire industry. Really, yeah, um, yeah. At this point, yeah. and then there's a theory about you know someone higher up mm. planting him. Yeah, really. Um, yeah, yeah, apparently. 
um, F, what's his name? S, F, S, S, F, P or some shit. What's it? SBF. SBF. That's yeah. right. But, um, SFP. SFP. <laughs> I don't fucking even know. But um, I, I learned about crypto like early, early. Mm. And I'm not going to yeah. say, oh, I should have invested 10 bucks into crypto, into yeah. Bitcoin, all that shit. Yeah. Um, how early are we, then, how early we talking? 2013. Yeah. I was about, I was, um, I think I bought my first Bitcoin in like 2012, but yeah. not for, Investing, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> and then got back into it. Um, 2017, before that massive yeah. bull run, yeah, made like a very significant amount of money that you know has lasted me to this day. And but you pulled out, pulled out at the right time. Um, yeah, good saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but yeah, so and I've essentially been a day trader, making cash, doing that sort of thing. Looking yeah. for, I've got a few private business investments as well yeah. with a few small brands. Um, what are your principles on that? So like obviously anybody who's investing at the moment has probably realized that, you know, reading the Warren Buffett books and all that sort of thing about fundamentals is important, but markets are really driven by hype now. Um, and not so much by business fundamentals. And given that we live in a very crazy macroeconomic times at the moment, yep. um, you can read all the balance sheets you want on a business, read the cash flow statements, be an absolute you know corporate finance guru. But if the the world economy is falling to shit, it doesn't matter how good a business is, it's going to be impacted. Yeah. So if you can figure out a way to you know get ahead of trends, Bitcoin, crypto, NFTs, all that sort of thing, high risk, but if you're an early adopter, there's a lot of ways to yeah. to make money. What are you doing to buy your time back permanently? To buy my time back? Permanently. Escaping the rat race. Setting up my business, you know? Like I wanna I wanna build something that I can uh, hopefully pass down to my kids and you know, hustle in my twenties, lay down a foundation keep building in my thirties and then, you know, get to my forties and actually look back and look, say that I've built something significant yep. that can ha- feed me essentially. Not uh, all businesses end up failing eventually. At some point. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a great way to put it. Yeah. So how are you buying your time back forever? <sighs> Always looking for business opportunities. Always yeah. looking for other opportunities to make money, to collaborate with people. Um, and as I said, like I'm 24, like I'm giving it a good go now, yeah. but my mind's been switched on to, how to make money not using your labor sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's like a really key thing that lots of kids and lots of people never actually end up learning. No, you know, it's not taught at school. Yeah. And it's like, and it's also like a, we're talking about education. Like it's a massive gap in our education system is financial education, you know? 100%. Like you don't have to go to a fucking get a u- university degree to be able to learn how to, you know, manage your finances anymore. Mm. You know, got all these resources online. It just takes motivation and effort on the individual to, you know, take another step forward and not, yeah. It just depends on what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. For me, for me, it's, um, what can give me dividends without me having to take over worst case scenario. Mm. And there's two ways to do it. Shares, index funds, because they give dividends yeah. and also houses. So you're talking about bank. passive income in a way, <laughs> passive, which is a bit of a myth in itself. Yeah, <laughs> passive income is non-existent, but yeah, you can get yeah. very close. Yeah. There's there's a yin and a yang, right? When mm. the housing market's going to shit, the share market's normally good, vice versa. But when they're both looking like they're a bit, how are you? Global financial crisis. That's when you have a nest egg of six to 12 months of living expenses, just in case. Even if they get in, eaten up by inflation over time, mm. doesn't matter. Worst case scenario, you've got that 20, 40, 60K to, to cover your basic cost of living. Yeah, just in step case. One, step yeah. one, presuming that you don't have debt. Because if you don't have debt, that should be your first step. Mm. Step two, have that nest egg. Step three, pay your future self first with index fund investing. Can't say which ones because I'm not a financial investor, mm-hmm. uh, advisor, legally, all that shit. Mm-hmm. But index funds is what gets you free. Yeah, and index funds and ETFs in general, like uh, for anybody who doesn't have the time to learn about investing on like a hardcore level, amazing way to get into it, you know. Just keep pumping some money into an ETF, a couple hundred dollars a week or a hundred dollars a week, bit of your paycheck. Yeah. And like markets, given enough time and given history, only really go up at the end of the day. The reality is if you can accelerate – it's going to sound a bit far-fetched to a lot of people, but $2 million is enough to escape the rat race. 
Two mil. Two mil. That's your number. Yep. Yeah. Four percent of two million is sixty four seventy four thousand. Mm. Seventy four you give or take. That's sixty thousand. Sixty to seventy four. I should know this, I'm a fucking math teacher, but <laughs> um it's around there, give or yeah. take a few uh, numbers. For like a yearly salary kind of thing. Yeah. You're talking about. Yeah. And that is as passive as it gets. Mm. Every eight years it might dip to below that. Yeah. Live within your means. Mm. Have that nest egg. Don't have debt. That's it. Two million. That's it. Mm. And I I'm so keen to get up to that to show people to go, this is why. When people win the lottery, I'm like, surely. Yeah. Surely, you know, but basketball, like like NFL mm. players as well, they 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 become bankrupt within well, two this years. This is what we we're talking about just before, like yeah. financial education. That's it. Is like one of the biggest problems I yeah. feel f- out of every other types of education. Mm. You know, particularly particularly in the Western world. Like I'm sure people in third world countries have other things to worry about, you know, <laughs> like poverty. Um, yeah. But in in the Western world, if you've got your basics sorted, you should really be focusing on how money works, learning yep. about all these sorts of things because that's the only way you're going to be able to, you know, might have yeah, have to work a job that you don't like but if you're financially savvy, there are other ways to, to go about making money exactly. to support yourself. So going, going back to your project and there's a good segue for a bit, um, good, good tangent for a bit. <laughs> um, how do you measure your impact of the stories that you tell on your platform? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, one way would just be to say using numbers and engagement rate, but that's probably not what you're asking. Vanity about. metrics. Yeah. <laughs> um, like I honestly, like I have no way to measure that. But when I have people, random people messaging me and hitting me up and saying, "I'm finding a lot of value in this content. Please keep what you're doing." And we're getting a lot now that our Instagram's blown up a lot. Having messages like that, like I had a dude from Pakistan actually, because they went through like a really hectic flood just recently. I think it was like the land equivalent of Great Britain was underwater, but, you know, in oh, Pakistan. Shit. Yeah. Had a dude message me because I did a, we did a story about like weather manipulation technology and all that sort of thing. And he reached out to us and had a big conversation, said he's a massive fan of, um, of the page um, and of what we're doing and essentially said, look, Obviously, what Pakistan's going through is really terrible. He told us about all the facts that was happening, all that sort of thing at the time. And, yeah, like we've had not on that level, that's probably the most significant one, but we've had lots of people reach out to us and say that, you know, what we're doing is a cool alternative. Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. And, like, yeah, it, it does – I feel like – providing high quality information to people that they can learn about and learn from is a really important thing. Yeah. 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 I love that. That, that, that is, that is impact. Mm. That is legacy building too. Future projects. Future projects. Um, would love to, my mind's completely on context at the moment, but would love to collaborate with other small, um, media businesses. Um, like the daily Oz would be one they, I think what they're doing is really amazing, even though they're kind of like leaning on the more political side. Um, what the way in which that they deliver their news, I think is really how, up and, up and coming news organisations should should think about um, you know delivering news really to a younger audience using social media in that sort of way. Um, but apart from that, haven't really got anything else on the horizon. At the Can't moment. wait to see what you do come up with. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm keen to see what the next couple of years brings. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. Now there's another one where. Um, we we're desperately getting onto the subject of chat GPT. This is the first time I'm mentioning it yeah. on the podcast. Um, and by the way, yes. any, any future student, university students listening to this, chat GBP3 is your best friend for writing essays. 100,000 all that sort of thing, eh? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think like the future of content creation and particularly for writers, um, like – in the next couple of years, like AI will probably take over the majority of online journalism jobs, you know. Define majority. Well, so it – okay, that's a, that's a bit large. But like particularly for science niches or like business economics and all that sort of thing, I feel like it needs a little bit more tinkering but – it's already at the point now where you could tell it to write you an article on say like thermodynamics and like the impact that that has on like rocket engineering or something yep. like that. And it will pump out like a pretty high quality. It might be a bit dry, no humanistic sort of elements to the writing, yep. um, but it'll pump out some quality stuff. So mm-hmm. I reckon in the next couple of years, 
like you'll probably see some, and they're probably already doing it now, some of these bigger publications like Wired, uh, Business Insider, all of these like uh, publications that are owned by like Conti Nast, advanced publications, like the biggest of the big. Yeah. Um, they're probably already tinkering around with that stuff, but yeah, I think, but I also think it's a good thing because like you can repurpose people who are just writing all the time to, to do other things, yes. you know, um, yes. into creating video content, which is expensive, but incredibly difficult to create sometimes. You can't, you can't replicate that with AI. No. It's like, going to take a few decades to do that. Yeah. For I don't, sure. I don't see it happening in the near future, mm. but, um, going in the right direction here, first industrial revolution, what happened? Um, people were able to use their labor to make money essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened when machines came in? Um, structural unemployment. What happened to, uh, where were the new jobs created though? Um, essentially repurposing people to um, manage the to manage and to look after all of the machines. The machines. Yeah. Right. So, it's history repeating itself, mm. but just on digital. Yeah. So the people that are now complaining about losing their writer's job, they need to start thinking about AI more, more than anybody else that's about to come in and, and start writing articles better than they do subjectively. Any writers listening to this, they they should be already using Chat GPT, for example, to optimize. And I've been a bit late to the game, but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, totally agree. Late to the game. I mean, there's people have been using it for over a year, yeah. but now it's become real mainstream mm. over the last week, and it's going to go even more hardcore over the next two three months. School holidays. When the school holidays finish, early uh, late Jan, early Feb. My God, the kids that are on that 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 are onto it, the schools will not be able to keep up. Yeah. They will not be able to police it mm -hmm. and it's going to be insane. And particularly with like tertiary stuff as well. Like, yeah. Like kids are already already doing it, obviously. Yeah. Um, but like there's no way unless like because you to, like you would go through, you'd get it to write you an essay and you would like if you were smart, you would just go in and sort of change it a little bit, you know, edit yeah. it up. So yeah, yeah. a little bit more humanistic yeah, as I'm saying. Yeah, before. get rid of the plagiarism flags. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So being in a student now is very, a lot easier. Yeah. So when I ask you about the majority, or define the majority, my definition of majority of being replaced are the ones that aren't completely passionate about that job mm. that are doing it for the money. The real ones, the real creatives who are passionate about the writing or whatever, they're going to pivot and they're going to optimize. And they should be more excited about it than anybody else because they're like, Holy shit, I'm about to save hours and hours and hours of research mm. and com compiling all this different data to write an article. It's going to do it for me and I'm just going to repurpose it in my own way. Mm. Oh, hang on. What if I get my previous articles I've written in my own way, tell the bot to go analyze my, my way of writing and then make and write this new article in my own way mm. and then – still put a bit of your own human flair on that. That is the new generation of someone monitoring the machine to deliver the, the product. Mm. It's all happening. Yeah, and it's like you need to teach yourself about what's – because the world's changing at a faster pace and like most people can actually like understand really geopolitically, technologically like and people need to – get onto it pretty much. hundred percent. Um, but yeah, like I'd, I was absolutely shocked about the power of just the, the normal chat G, GPT was like amazing. And I kind of suspect that uh, like Google is obviously probably going to be a big competitive for that. Google's scared already. Yes. They're already putting it flags operates up. In, a, in a way similar to how a search engine works. Yeah. But instead of feeding you articles and stuff, it gives you like a customized straight to the point, written, like computer written no answer. ads. Yeah. Amazing. And no <laughs> bullshit. No, this is a fake thing. And going back to your news um, mm. stuff, you've got, you could fact check it. It's facts. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've created SOPs um, from this in the last week that I would have taken probably weeks to get around to mm. doing for one. Yeah. It actually motivates me more and excites me more as a creator because the script writing part is done for me. Yeah. And I'm not waiting for a writer to to do their research and no disrespects to them. They still have a place, but my God, I've written so much content in the last seven days. Now I just have to, now, now the more tedious part is actually recording it. Mm. 
I reckon the next bit is editing. The editing is going to be insane. I mentioned this a couple of days ago for the YouTube. YouTube's going to have a thing. This is my prediction. Um, upload this podcast. YouTube's already got an automatic transcriber, right? It, it reads yeah, what it it's says. Yeah, it's pretty powerful as talk, well. Yeah, yeah, talk to text has been around for a while. Mm. But now it's going to go, I'm going to analyze it and find the most interesting points. I'm going to take that and I'm going to snippet it. I'm going to convert it to a short and then I'm going to put a, I'm going to move a dial on YouTube to go 10. I want 10 videos from this. Generate them for me. Auto caption it for me. And then all I have to do is review them to make sure, mm, nah, kind of missed the point mm. there or uh, the cuts are not quite right. That's the management side of it. That's the handling the machine. And that way, like you could use the AI to essentially pick out little bits of new content that might be trending as well. That exactly. might actually know that. Oh my God. Um, give you exposure to a larger audience essentially. But yeah, yeah no, it's a very powerful tool. Like, and it's like trying to wrap your head around vir- virality as well mm. on social media. It doesn't really make sense because like nobody actually understands no. how the algorithm works. It's all like... You the can, AI you can does. Inc- yes, the AI does. But who understands the AI at the end of the day? Like yeah. it's sort of like, you know, you have programmers doing their own thing, but it kind of, it'll react and act in ways that, you know, is unpredictable. Skynet's going to take take it soon. For sure. And if they keep like, making militarized robo dogs as well, that's going to be Yeah, I saw that of video problem. of that robot you had the other day. Mm. First thing that came to mind when I saw that video was the AI starts becoming self-aware and this fucking robot's standing up and just start to chop people up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which one was that? Was that like the one that we the did? The one that just like like is like a little spider yeah, kind of like stands fucking, up. Yeah, it looks like yeah, a table yeah. and then yeah. starts moving. I'm like, yeah. nah, fuck that. Yeah. Like robotics. Just is, the way that it moves, it sends a bit of shivers down your spine, eh? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like just because it can be done, should it be done? Mm. Becomes yeah, exactly. that question. And like the, the Robo Dog thing, like Boston Dynamics does like a, a bunch of crazy cool stuff. And they're like, yeah, they'll just be helpers. And then like within like a couple of weeks, you just see some dude strapping a machine gun to it yeah. and teaching it how to shoot. So, you know. Why? There's always going to be some military aspect to it, you know. Yeah, it's like uh, <laughs> Robo War has been around for decades now. Yeah, yeah. Love that shit. Yeah. Always love watching it. And it's just like instead of us – having wars with one another, we have machine wars against each Doing other. Doing it for us. And she's yeah. like, wait, wait, hang on, why? What, what mm. like, if, if, if our machines over- overpower their machines, then that just becomes the new front line where it starts attacking the humans. You put a bit of artificial intelligence into that that becomes self-aware, all of a sudden they turn on us and they're Skynet, Terminator 1, how are you? Yeah. Terminator 2, that one. It's definitely. <laughs> and if you've, like, chat GDP is, like, just the beginning. You yeah. Know? Um, do you reckon we're in, in for some doom in the next hundred years as humanity, or do you have a little bit more? Uh, look, I I spend a, a number of my you know coming up years being a pessimist, and I try yeah. to be optimistic now mm. um, because it's just gotten me further. <laughs> but I think, Same. unfortunately, I think um, being a realist sort of comes with pessimism at the end of the day, which is kind of a bit of a shame. But I I, I mean, our biggest concern should really be. Um, the situation with China at the moment. I wouldn't worry too much about AI robots taking over just yet because I feel like we're a number of years before then. I'm more concerned about humans at this stage. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very true, very true. It just takes one fuck up though, one fuck up by the wrong person yeah. who doesn't think about it and we're, we're doomed. But on a more positive note, especially going back to GPT chat, chat GPT, um, the way that it's evolving now and these holidays is like a perfect time for me to just absolutely learn about it. Like we've, we've created an accountability club um, a few months ago and now where we've created a document where we're finding different commands that we learn about it. TikTok, my whole TikTok for you page is just that. It's all it is now and I love it. Yeah. Because now I'm like sick. I'm not getting dumbass videos anymore. I'm getting shit that I'm interested in. Mm. And, and you can train it to do that. It is possible. So there goes the theory of eh, the Western world does send you educational stuff, but you have to force it to. Yeah. It skews to the bullshit stuff because it's easier and it's easier to manipulate the brain for entertainment because it's quicker, right? The dopamine hit comes quicker. But with the educational stuff, write down a list of three things that you enjoy learning about or you find interesting. Start searching them on TikTok. Start 
interacting with them, liking them, commenting them. And then every time you're on the For You page, just your, your aim there, scroll, scroll, scroll until you find one of them. Watch the whole thing twice, comment on it, like it, do it to the next thing. And that's how I hacked it over an hour. Yeah, then the algorithms is going to start feeding you that shit. Exactly, yeah. because it keeps you on the app. Yeah. That's the main, main, yeah. main aim. I also think there's uh, more onus needs to be put on content creators like ourselves yes. to be doing better at creating content that can actually educate people in a better way mm. and sort of, you know, because that's our jobs at the end of the day, you know, providing information in a way where people are going to absorb it, but they're also entertained and like a whole, the whole trifecta of things yeah. need to come together. It's hard to say that to a 19 year old girl who's been genetically blessed with looks, figure, talent of movement and vocals, all of the above yeah. to get to rise to the top really quickly, even younger, right? And get millions of views for what she does. And then tell her, right, now make actual content of value. Oh, but it is content of value. Mm. I'm making people happy. I'm like, yeah, happy for how long? When you laugh, it is an instant holiday. When you stop laughing, that holiday's over. You want to keep laughing, so you prolong that holiday. Once that holiday finishes, you're back to reality. And to be fair, like the only marketing efforts that I pay attention to are adverts and native content or anything that actually does make me laugh, you know, yeah. like even what like occasionally you have on free to air television, the only ads that you pay attention to are things that make me laugh yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. I retain that information really Old well. Old Spice. Yeah. I'm on a horse. Beautiful, beautiful All stuff. All time. Yeah. <laughs> he was the goat of ads. But I meant like what I was trying to say is – like people who are making that sort of content that you're describing, stick to that. You know, that's their niche. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. But for people like us trying to create educative yeah. content, we need to just be doing better. You know, yeah. I feel like, and that's sort of like what the mission is to be able to make content that's entertaining, but isn't going to actually just kill your brain cells. Yeah. And it's challenging given how algorithms work, but there is a way around it. Yeah. Thoughts on this statement or more of a question, really who works hard? It's a question who works harder over 10 years, educators pushing out content or entertainers pushing out content? That's a good question. And they're both different in their, and challenging in their own rights, I'd say. But And it depends on the sort of entertainment that you're doing. Like, Say, for instance, you're like a stand-up comedian. God, that would be a fucking, that would be a tough job, you know, um, putting content out like that. But I think really trying to stretch your brain into new ideas being a more of an educator for important topics um, requires discipline and effort to be able to get to the point where you feel comfortable enough actually spreading that information. And passion. And, and passion. That's another big word. Like you need to feel like you're, what you're doing is benefiting the world to put us into a better position. And entertainment's amazing. Like it's, and it's important for people to, to, you know, have a break from daily life. But it's, it became, it's a slippery slope where you fall into this trap of just, you know, always staring at your phone or always on Netflix just trying to numb yourself. Yeah, and but the other side of the coin, the mm. creators. So it is, it is, you do get trapped, but the creators that are either educational or entertaining, both entertainment is obviously mm. the key. Yeah. That's how I hacked the student's attention at school. But the entertainers only, I'm finding that they're getting depressed, stressed. Like the girls on OnlyFans – they're like, how good's this? You know, getting yeah. subs and stuff. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm seeing them come up going, I'm having the most stressful, I'm having the biggest mental health problem right now I've ever had. Yeah. Whereas a week ago, they were posting going, how good's this? I've made my first 50K month. Yeah. But how did you go from that to that? Well, that's what I mean. Like it's it's the extreme, the extreme of everything. That's what social media yeah. is, right? And that's unfortunately um, – obviously after all these like whistleblowers with Facebook and stuff, how mm. the algorithms work, they push you to extreme ends of mental health issues yeah. and all that sort of thing, extreme political views. So like, and particularly say if you're like a young girl and you're, you're, you know, doing OnlyFans, which is okay, you know, should be able to do what you want. Um, but you have to expect that if you're constantly seeking validation externally, it's going to take a toll on you. Yeah. You know? And that comes to my final question, the role of the media companies like yourself what is the importance of how they play in shaping the public discourse of understanding whatever the, the content is? Going back to, 
you know, the Rupert Murdoch shit mm-hmm. overseas and whoever fucking owns the media there, the left, I think. What about you? People get compromised all the time. How do I know you're not compromised? How do I know that your content that you're putting out for me, for for my friends, for your audience, it's not strategic to, you know, to manipulate them la- later? Yeah. And I'm not good question. It's not just you for you, but mm. how do we realize? Oh, this media channel is actually bullshit. Mm. Well, it's yeah, and like obviously you need to balance what's socially acceptable and running a business, right? And you need to be able to fuse the two so you're not actually making money in a way that's going to, Mm. you know, corrupt in a way. Um, But I think the mainstream media is the way that it is, is because it's incredibly polarizing. You know, it splits people down the middle. It's always breaking news, political issues, um, all these sort of things that is really like high intensity, and for context, I just want it to be about cool shit, innovation, technology, and having somebody coming on board and trying to like overtake that um, in a way that's not going to be, you know, aligned with our values. I just wouldn't be about it, you know. Um, and I think it's really important for for independent media organisations to take a hard look at themselves and go, all right, maybe we're catching a bit of fire on on social media we're doing well but is what we're providing actually benefiting people in a educative manner and about things that aren't going to just create you know unhealthy discourse about certain issues so but i do think there are ways to pick out people who are bullshit online and it's just you know you need to politics for one anybody who's talking shit about politics is kind of just I should just stay away from because it's just going to make you do circles in your head at the end of the day. Um, but stick to people who really seem passionate about what they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And to, to add to that, finally, I would say look up the Socratic method, go through the Socratic method, anything that you don't or not sure about watching, consuming, go through the Socratic method with that content and really, really dig deep into what you're reading, viewing, listening to because if there's a red flag, once you go through that method, it's probably bullshit and that's it and that's a good conclusion. Thanks for coming in, man. Thank you so much for having me. What do we, uh, how do we find you, all the rest? So our biggest page is um, on Instagram, so Context Media, C-O-N-T-X Media, but our Medium page is where we publish all of our articles as well, so you should give that a a check as well. I look forward to uh, doing a follow-up sooner. Yes. But then also uh, when you're uh, in, in in your 10th year, yeah, that'll be exciting. That'll be exciting sure. as well. Yep. So we're definitely going to build a relationship um, off camera and yeah. on camera. Okay. Um, Only fans. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, all the rest. So uh, let, let us know what you thought. I'm going to add a question on the Spotify channel um, that will open up uh, questions for Zach. And uh, if you have any other questions, he listens and he responds to the DMs. If you listen to this five years from now, he's probably overwhelmed and probably has a bot chatting to you <laughs> to your responses, if not already. But uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, thanks again, Zach. Uh, as always, good thanks. 